I'm Isander. And I am Coda. And today we will be doing our part in signing up for the Navy. In the Navy. <laughs> the people in the Imperium in who the give Navy. the Guard a run for their money when it comes to just body count. There's a lot of people in the Navy. I would figure. I mean, considering this all takes place in space, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. It's, need a big space it, Navy. It, no, the, the, it's, it's massive, and a good chunk of this episode... It, there's no better way to describe what a lot of this episode will be other than our first stop will be at Girth Street, South Africa. It's a real street. Look it up. Don't doubt me. Girth Street, South Africa. Yep. Look it up. Uh, but before we get there, we need your help. Flight tickets to Girth Street are painfully expensive and you can help us get there by heading on over to patreon.com slash isander and coda but this is not a one-way deal you don't just help us get to girth street my friends by heading over there you get twice as many episodes as well as our whole backlog of other episodes i'm talking stuff on the black templars i'm talking stuff on the death core it goes on and on there's some really good stuff on there as well as bloopers if they happen monthly live streams a q and a and a bunch of other perks i'm not exaggerating when i easily say it's one of the best bang for your buck patreons out there so if you want to help support us while getting just tons and tons for very little head on over to patreon.com slash isander and coda for those of you already there thank you very much for those of you doing that as i speak thank you as well it is also that time of the month baby where it is polls it is poll time yep the options are this one's going to be close pretty much is it going to be close oh these are the ones i see some of the most often the custodies Aha. the raven guard Whoa. malkador <laughs> and the white scars oh yep oh it's going to be close those Maybe are not for the white scars but oh no Oh, you, you, Wait, really? Have I been be, missing out? You'd be surprised. I've been Funnily enough, out. there's some of the first comments every time. <laughs> <laughs> They're quick with it. They're very quick with it. Uh. So those are your options. You sound off by voting in the comments. You guys get to decide. So if you want an episode on the custodies, I better see it down there. May the most popular or the ones who are the most dedicated win. Lastly, next week is the channel's one year anniversary. That it is. Yeah. And to celebrate, man, time does fly. Time does we fly. We will be doing a Q&A here on YouTube. So for those of you that have questions, this is your time. So be sure to leave those in the comments as well. That will be next Saturday's episode. And that one should be really fun. It will be really fun. Uh, we usually do those on Patreon, but it's, it's a year. It's, it's going to be a big might as, might as well. Now, let's get back to Girth Street. Because as with everything in the Imperium, it does not matter how you use it at all. But, but <laughs> the fleets of the Imperial Navy are humongous. The scale is... They patrol whole swaths of the galaxy alone and the ships have to be impervious to most conventional fire i mean yeah because you can going at speed yeah space you're gonna hit something however before we get into the bulletproof barges we kind of have to zoom out a bit because to help give a, a proper sense of scale to what you're seeing um i have a map of the milky way that you can take a look at and will definitely be up in the episode. Unless you're listening, in which case, just envision the Milky Way divided up pretty badly into five separate sectors. It's divided uh, with the center being Earth because, of course, we are geocentric in this universe. Why wouldn't we? (laughs) And those splits you're seeing are the very segmentums. They are large swaths of space that exist mainly for administrative purposes because you, you gotta you gotta organize things right the organization makes sense yeah exactly if you'll notice the the the, the ultramarine segment is huge massive because of course it is they're the ones who'd organize you know it, it makes sense right ah uh, i don't know how i didn't put two and two together it's the ultima segment yeah Come God, on. they really do name everything the exact same thing they're they're very consistent <laughs> they're very good branding now you see all those massive swaths correct yes each of those is the domain of one fleet. Whoa. That is their job. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there are five major fleets, and they're usually named after their segmentum, or even sometimes a small area within the segmentum. So you have like Battlefleet Ultima. I wonder who they I wonder where their job is, right? Yeah. You know, Battlefleet Solar. You can yeah. guess. And then when it comes to the subsectors, you have like Battlefleet Gothic which guards the gothic subsector. You see, see, it's really, you can tell what their job is or where their job is, at least, by looking at their name. Those five splits 
Each one is under one man. Oh. So there are five dudes in charge oh. of all that. That is... <laughs> and that guy has oh. a massive headquarter that is both a command post and a home base to repair and rebuild the entire fleet. I, I, I show this specifically because I want you to drink in the size of the task that they have at hand. It's not some small job. They all, each fleet, even each battle fleet has thousands of light years they have to cover with in some zero cases, assistance. That's a lot more than thousands. Yeah, it's it's the vastness of space and the very void is their battlefield. It's the single largest theater imaginable and they really can't think of anything that would be harder to defend. <laughs> like let's 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 be real here. Defending the Milky Way period that's a it's that's a, a task. tall order. Yeah, it's a task and if you fail at it you will doom thousands of worlds. The Imperium is said to consist of a million worlds. You are the glue that holds it all together. A glue that is spread very thinly over trillions of miles. We're not talking Elmer's. We're talking that weird stick glue that would never properly stick. And you'd always have the corners pop up on whatever you'd glued down and it would just tear off eventually. And it was just a mess all the time. And on top of all of that, it's not just spread really thin. There's stuff in there, too. Stuff that's very angry at you, almost by default. It ranges from hilariously competent to horrifyingly dangerous. Everything from bumping into the Eldar, which will just outskill you, they will move faster than you with better weapons, and you cannot do a thing about it, to the resident dumb brutes, the orcs. I mean, listen, if I were to throw moldy bread at you, and it blew up on contact, that's still a problem. It doesn't matter if it's moldy bread. No, if I threw moldy bread at you and then upon impacting your face, it like burst into like an eight foot tall man with fists the size of his torso. It's still a problem. <laughs> it's a huge problem. And that's not even the worst of it because you're just putzing about in space. Tyranid hive fleets move in space. <laughs> so you could just be going about one day and find a whole hive fleet, its maw opening to eat worlds. And you have to stop it. It's like, oh, whoops. Mm -hmm. Oh, you stumbled upon this now. You want to call in backup? Right. From who? The other segmentums? They have their own problems. <laughs> they, you have to figure it out. They also have their own unique brand of Tyranid that they're fighting. It's, it's a really, really tough job. And combat for them is either instant death. Just, there's a battle fleet. Why is it silent? <laughs> Why did that blip just go out? Or the alternative, which is like old school naval combat where you're just kind of circling each other for a while, just firing. Because shields in 40k are pretty effective. You have to get through it somehow. So sometimes it, <laughs> combat can take days. Combat can take weeks if it's between two similar ships and both pi uh, both captains are competent. And with the with the stage set, it is now time to bring back the signpost from Girth Street because to accomplish that massive and frankly impossible job, you will need frankly impossible weapons. And that the navy has in spades. Oh. <laughs> it they have ships that are measured in kilometers. It is, before we get into that, lean in here for me, because this is this is between me and you, okay? 40K has a problem with numbers. They really do. They tend to get ridiculous, and it's really hard to gauge the size of things down to the hyper-specifics. You usually have a range. When I'm doing these episodes, I like hyping this faction to the logical maximum, because if I ever happen to do an episode on the Tyranid Hive Fleets, the Navy is going to be the butt of the joke for most of that. <laughs> and so, to give the Navy their flowers, I will be going with the largest confirmed numbers. Just setting the scale, because I know there are some people who are very specific about numbers, okay? So if you have any questions, remember, largest confirmed sizes. Mileage will vary. <laughs> I'm not joking, by the way. With Kilometerage. Th with that out of the way, the stuff they, f they field today tends to be 12 kilometers long. That's seven and a half miles. <laughs> and the largest ships the Navy's ever technically had? Yes. 20? 
20? 20. Very solid guess. That would be the Gloriana class battleship. 20 is the smallest size they came in. <laughs> 26 is the size of Gilliman's personal one. Oh my god. God. <laughs> that, Leave it to Gilliman to have the ship that needs to be organized like an entire city. That is 16 miles of just ship. I have a little um, slide up there for you that I wanted you to take a look at, and we will also put this up here as well. That is Gilliman's flagship. That is 26 kilometers. That is 26 kilometers and of... It's scaled like a normal ship. That is 26 kilometers of Gilliman's ship at the right appropriate color, as is mandated by Gilliman, with a wreath up front. <laughs> because they commit to the bit so hard. It's... It's ridiculous. And... While you're drinking that in, both viewers and Coda, I want you to remember that's the biggest ship the Navy's ever technically had. That's 26 kilometers right there. Not the biggest ship the Imperium has ever had. Oh. <laughs> because I, my favorite story for the Imperium scale will always be the Tau hearing about Titans and going, Pfft, that's, that's not stupid. real. That, that is stupid. Real. Why would anyone devote that many resources time? First of all, who has that many resources and time to build something that gargantuan? And Titans are puny relative to that. Listen, listen, we're the mech guys. If we didn't make it, nobody could. <laughs> oh my god, somebody made it! <laughs> the Imperium did. They are so comically big. And specifically the Gloriana there was mostly meant for the Primarchs. Like, there's 21, I think, of them, if, if I remember correctly. And, uh, no, 22, I think, because Alpharis and Omega on each got one. Yeah. Um, Alpha and Beta. <laughs> Come on. Um, if I remember correctly, there's only 22 of them. The Navy did technically get one. However, this was back when the Navy and the Army were kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. They've since been split up because the heresy made power. You can't concentrate power. You don't like concentrate that. anything. Yeah, you cannot. who knows when it might just betray us all. Yeah, however, <laughs> because the Primarchs had those ships, that means for every single time you see Gilliman's ship arrive to save the day, there are traitor ones coming too. So imagine being the poor person in charge of a fleet when you hear the largest ship ever, almost three times the size of yours, is arriving with one of the Emperor's sons aboard. <laughs> you now have a target painted on you. You're dead. <laughs> You're dead. There's no target painted on you. You're dead. The stuff accompanying those ships are the stuff that the uh, Navy still fields today, the 12 kilometer long ones. And um, <laughs> those ones we have to, we, we have to rein it in a bit because that's massive. But the ones that they still feel today are ridiculous. To give a sense of scale, a single gun aboard that ship is roughly the size of a modern day carrier. <laughs> I actually have a demo. I have a. I found a picture that really shows the scale of it really well. And it at the top right, no top, yeah, no top right. You will see a tiny little dot. That tiny little dot. <laughs> Is a modern day U.S. <laughs> Navy carrier. <laughs> if you've ever seen a carrier, yeah. And that full bore thing at the very bottom with the, because those are the poster boy ships. They, they usually have that um, kind of, it looks like a ram at the front of the ship, and it's usually solid steel. Yeah, that is the biggest that they field today. It is a solid 12 kilometers long. And it has a crew that can number in the millions. That's an entire city right there. Uh, no, like, U.S. carriers are large enough that you could drive a car on them. Not for very long, but you could drive a car on them. Or at least take planes off at of least land. a little go-kart or like golf cart you could drive on it. You could probably put an entire train system on that large one. You need one. You need one. And a city is underselling it. That is basically a floating country. Oh, <laughs> These are millions. There, uh, there are some records of some ships having their own language. <laughs> yeah. And no, those... that's that's great sci-fi. I might add. Right. It's awesome sci-fi. I love it when I love it when forty K does this stuff. It's that's so like, much fun. That's like. Uh, does anybody remember uh, what was it? Mortal Engines, the one, the one movie and book series about the cities on wheels. This is that taken to its logical extreme, and I'm kind of here for it. I know. Um, they are all self-sufficient, and they all have incredibly good names. I'm talking the Emperor, the Nemesis, the Apocalypse, the Victory, the. In
It goes on and on because the Imperium has almost no sense of humor. <laughs> they want that thing to arrive and everyone goes, oh, yay. Oh, yay. The victory has arrived. <laughs> and then the victory will arrive following that. It's it's so it is so great. It'll be such a shame when the victory goes down. Yeah, it's kind of like naming a ship unsinkable. <laughs> I, I don't like I don't like the, the name. In I really I don't like even if it's for a whole class of ships. I really don't like that. I'll be honest. Listen, maybe it's like the post Titanic um, uh, stress, and you know. I think I'm valid for this. If I walk onto a ship and it's like named the Immortal or the Invincible or the Untouchable, I'm leaving. I'm, I'm leaving. off. I'm off. And Goodbye. also, because in 40k, the way it works is like, if the, the spirit aboard is truly not that lucky, like some, some ships are straight up cursed is what I'm going to say. There are some ships where you will get on and the average life expectancy is comically short. <laughs> And that's just, that ship's luck. Whoops, that's how it is. Because in 40k, some things can truly just be cursed. Lamenters. <laughs> that's it, exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, and so, when you when you take the fact that these have millions of men aboard, they, they can have their own culture aboard, right? And you take into the fact, just think about the resources it takes to make one of those. You yeah. realize losing one of these is, losing a fleet is not, catastrophic it's not a big problem it's like an extinction level event oh yeah it, a whole culture can die off because you lost a fleet mm -hmm. they take them very seriously and that's before we get into the fact that the imperium is very religious about their gear they are and and, and people like to take the piss out of this a lot they like to say it's the most um ridiculous facet of the setting it's not because in real life, in real life, humans behave like that. This is just, it's logical extreme. We, uh, humans as a whole, like to give, like, think about ships. A ton of ships have history and character and tales around them. I've known people in the Navy who've served on a specific ship, and it's it's gotten its own kind of culture for it. I, I mean, shoot, you don't even have to be a whole ship. You and I have had friends where their cars have character. Mm-hmm. I've had a buddy with a BMW that required everyone to exit it and give it a fiver to breathe just so it could get up a hill someday. <laughs> my car, my car does the same thing. She always needs her like, okay, oh, I've just woken up. I need five minutes to warm up and then, and then you can floor me. I can't even throw stones because my first car, the one I love the most, was four colors, one of which was rust. <laughs> and I still loved it. That thing had character. It is human nature to give possessions a kind of spirit a kind of personality whether it has it or not i mean and i think i could be wrong on this but if, if not, i'm fairly certain i'm correct the swedes will correct me uh they've replicated a ship from the 1700s named the gothenburg <laughs> I love and it's the gothenburg. still used today i think it did like a rescue operation it did do a rescue <laughs> operation and just Seeing the videos of the people just like stranded in the middle of the ocean, watching this 17, uh, I think it was a ship that was designed in 1726, mm -hmm. just floating in. <laughs> Can you imagine being saved by that? Am I getting, is this, am I, did I travel back into the time of pirates? Yeah, am I back in the golden age of piracy? What's going on? It's, <laughs> it's reasonable human behavior. Humans will pack bond with almost anything. I think my favorite example of this is when, oh, I'm forgetting the name of it. But for example, oh, the one of the rovers, I'm forgetting its name. Obviously, you can't. They will They will eventually fail. That It's part of the design. The goal mm -hmm. is you learn as much as possible before they go kaput, right? Mm -hmm. Or it was one of the satellites we've sent out. Regardless, one of them. Um, NASA engineers actually, you know, shed tears when they had to decommission the thing. Because mm -hmm. it's like, I've, I've been working with, yeah, it's a bunch of metal thousands of miles away, but I've been working with it for so long. I gave it a name. Yeah. Like we named things Discovery, Curiosity. It's human nature. The Voyager 2, when that gets, it has, if, if, if it's already been decommissioned, I'm going to be actually sad. But that thing's journey just like out. Yeah. Since when? The, the 80s? It's, that's insane. I can't. I can understand working with something for 40 years and then having to say goodbye. Yeah, it's it, and, and that's just a few years. That's a human lifespan. Imagine if that object has been around for generations. 
No wonder the Imperium worships their gear. It totally makes sense because it's not just a car with quirks and features or even a ship that's been around since the 1700s. It is the country. Your dad worked on board. You're a gunman. Your dad was a gunman. His dad before that was a gunman. Your grandfather, 50 times over, great, 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 he served when the emperor was crusading. Like, these ships are almost... It's no longer just this super weapon meant to pub stomp. It's a home. Mm -hmm. it, it's something worth fighting and inevitably dying for because there are many others like this, but this one's mine, you know? It's, it's my patch of dirt. <laughs> and, and that prestige is also enhanced by the fact that in 40K, the older things are, the better they tend to be. Because humanity's technological progress is uh, it's, <laughs> an, uh, it's not doing great. It's, it leaves a lot to be desired, actually. And so you have these relics that are truly ancient, that people have lived and died aboard, that are some of the most powerful vessels we have. Suddenly, it's not just a catastrophic loss of life. It's the loss of equipment, gear. It, they're irreplaceable. Some of them are, tr like, for example, take like, the Primark ships, those massive ones. If one goes down, they can't rebuild that. That's it. No, because that was built in the in the 30th millennium. They don't have that tech anymore. They don't have those resources anymore. Mm -hmm. There's probably no way they could do that without some form of, like, chaos or tyrannid infestation just disrupting it every half second. And you it's see impossible. why. And now you see why those things have guns all over them, as well as hundred of feet of just armor. Because if that thing goes, no, n no. So a lot can be lost if a resident fleet is gone. I'm talking worlds just vanishing because nobody could arrive on time. So they have quantity. A lot of, I mean, sheer volume of firepower, but also quality too. It's not just, oh, you, this is a ship with kilometers of guns. It is kilometers of guns that will fire a barrage that will explode repeatedly as it travels. So that, oh, you missed? No, you didn't. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. It's impossible, too. They fire weapons that are so stupendously large that they are what planets are destroyed with. I mean, if you look at the, the last image that we showed off... Um, would you like a, 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 a 30 centimeter round? No, I want a 333 meter round. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> these these things have the, you know, like when, when a planet's declared dead, exterminatus, one of them po like floats over and does it usually. And if a ship is sufficiently dangerous, well, I mean, if it's good enough for a planet, if I can land it on that ship, it's probably good enough for the ship. Yeah, Let's I be would, real. I would imagine, yeah. They, <laughs> they fire weapons that are so massive even when you consider the size of it, it has to have a complex firing pattern. Otherwise, it would knock itself off course with the recoil. They have to do engine balancing routines for the for the cannon fire. It's that massive. They have the, and I'm, very, I'm simplifying a lot here, they have the answer to, what if we made a LAS gun that is multiple feet long and just fired a hundred of those at something? They... <laughs> They fire missiles that will either explode and flood everything with lava because doy. They have missiles that on impact will be the largest explosion you have ever seen. Or it will burrow deep inside your ship and out pop space marines. <laughs> just like the uh, the fan animation. The Astarte is a fan animation. Yeah. The drop ships that just like, hi, I'm well, here now. It's slightly different from a drop ship. It's, it's, it is described as a missile. <laughs> It's 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 pretty much the the way it's described is the forces the the people inside undergo are so extreme that only a space marine could survive it. Oh yeah, I would imagine. It's it's not as gentle as a, and even drop 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 ships are, are not gentle. They're not that gentle either, but no. it's not as gentle as that. It's really mean stuff. But I mean, hey, you're taking out my ship, but now there's marines aboard, so it'll be their ship soon. <laughs> Good luck dealing with that. And that's not even the strongest stuff they have, because the creme de la creme is the Nova Cannon. The Nova Cannon. If this thing is aimed correctly, it can just one-shot someone. Bare minimum. I mean, 
if the name is to be like believed, if it's accurate, then yeah, that could I could imagine that would one shot a couple things. Do you remember those massive twelve kilometer ships I showed you? Mm-hmm. It's usually mounted only to the front of those because it's the only ship with enough real estate space to put it there. And when you fire it, you have to engage your thrusters at max just to undo the recoil. <laughs> it is comical just watching this thing get fired it's described as both a super weapon and a psychological weapon because if a crew watches that get fired and it misses i give up i give up i give up don't please don't hit me it's it's the equivalent of mid chess tournament at the very beginning you lose a pawn you whip out a grenade launcher i give up jesus I thought we had some rules here, but sure, I suppose you win. God. I love the recoil cancellation, though. Having to engage the thrusters at full. Yeah. Like, imagine, imagine, imagine. To fire a gun to counter the recoil, you need to run at full sprint forward. And you're just sliding as you're firing it. You want to know the worst thing about it? It's mounted at the front. Thrusters in the back, obviously. So when you see... Crush. No, no, when you see, when you see the thrusters engaging, you're like, oh, they're going to fire the stupendous weapon at me. I'll dodge. And then the ship just rams you instead. Oh. Because that's not a decoration up front. They will occasionally just hard ram a ship. They can just faint. And because they are so ginormous, they'll just cut through it without any issue at all and just keep going. Yeah. It's actually one of the quickest ways engagements with them can go because barring that, it's that slow circle between massive ships as they slowly try and whittle each other down. Mm-hmm. And... I, from If you're in that situation where you're locked in this long combat, you kind of won't know what's going on until it's all settled. Because if I'm a gunner up here firing, right, and there's an engine going critical six miles away down here. I'm not going to feel it. I won't know until it's too late. Mm-hmm. And if I'm the captain in charge of millions of people, I'm not going to freak them all out. I will either let them know once the situation is fixed or alternatively, once it cannot be fixed. Though, honestly, 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 the Imperium has such fervor for its empire, for its 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 existence, that it's probably part of the, 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 the driving motivation for them. Just like, hey, we're going to die soon because the engine's gone critical, but fire as many shots as you can before it goes critical and make them dead too. There's nothing better than to give your life in service of the Emperor. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the whole nine. Exactly. The captains on board have a lot of responsibility, and because of that, they have a lot of power. They are some of the highest ranking people in the Imperium, and unless you're north of an Inquisitor, while on board their ship, you want to be fairly respectable. <laughs> You want to be fairly respectable because uh, there's a Navy saying that goes, the Emperor may be the master of the galaxy, but the captain is the master of his ship. And so even Inquisitors, unless absolutely necessary, will not just go around forcing ships to do their will. They will usually be cordial. They'll usually be polite. They will, you know, they'll hang out with the captain. Just think of this as like, think about this logically. These are city or even small country-sized ships there's probably a lot of real estate to get lost in there yeah oh and who knows the captain may just find the perfect place to lose you an inquisitor was reported aboard your ship oh yes he was in the landing bay five miles away he seemed to have disappeared before i got there (laughs) i have no idea what's going on but there could be chaos aboard this ship let's Mm -hmm. get to looking Mm -hmm. (laughs) Whoops. Don't don't screw around on an Imperial ship. Do not screw around on an Imperial ship. Uh, however, it is not it is not all grueling warfare, dangerous conditions, and abuse of power. A lot of the time, it's just patrolling. Because, <laughs> I mean, think about how much area you have to cover. Yeah. There's multiple thousands, even hundreds of thousands of light years to cross. Mm-hmm. If you're not patrolling, you're also basically just usps it's pretty much it i mean stuff needs to get places and space is dangerous so even if you're not necessarily moving it you're guarding the stuff being moved usually i mean how do you think the guard get places so that they can go die (laughs) it's the navy's job and the funny thing is from there if there's not a naval engagement they'll just watch (laughs) because if i fire if I try and offer you suppressive fire on the ground, that is so cool. You are now standing on magma. 
It's again, look at the massive 333 meter bore cannon. Yeah. You fire that, you've taken out an area the size of multiple city blocks. Yeah. Uh, a if not more. A whole Titan, a whole Chaos Titan could be fielded and the Navy would not immediately begin sundering it unless the whole planet needed to go. Yeah. Or unless they were directly told, well, this risk. Because think about the casualties alone mm -hmm. from you firing it. Yeah, you'll get that. You will get that chaos. You will get that chaos titan. But however, you will get everybody else. However, how about we try fielding our own titan? I mean, they're just like five minutes away. Let's let's try them first. And then if that fails, then sure, sure, sure. We can try the other approach. I think I think the only I think the only guard regiment that you could get away with doing a danger close operation oh, with the Death Corps. Death Corps. They'd love it. They, of course, this is what I've been waiting for. Any <laughs> Do that. it. Yeah. I'm ready. So they're the ones who ship Titans places. Well, they, they don't technically do the shipping, but they do the protection of the shipping. They do hard ship the guards, though. They're the ones who move them around. Yeah. And occasionally, Space Marines need to schlep around places, too. So they will occasionally help Space Marines get places, too, though. Usually Space Marines have their own ways of getting places, their own ships. Because Space Marines are very insular. They're, they're very... They're, they're, yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're very, their, their own thing. Yeah. However, I mean, even Space Marine ships need crews. They need extra firepower sometimes. And I'll be real. Cool. You're super tall and fast. Nova Cannon. Nova Cannon. Sometimes you need something with a Nova Cannon to counter that, you know? Dodge this, you filthy casual. <laughs> I mean, and and all of that means it's entirely possible for you to have an in, a whole career aboard a ship and never see combat. Your whole time there, it's just transportation, logistics, and the occasional just hold there. Maybe we'll need you to fire. Mm -hmm. Maybe, but we'll try not eradicating the planet first. Or if we do, we'll use the smaller weaponry. It's not the full side of it barraging the planet. And even if it is the full side barraging a planet or another ship, you may not be directly involved. I mean, just think about the, the U.S. Navy, right? It Today, it's not just midways happening constantly, where it's at a moment's notice and you are ready to lay your life down whenever. Nowadays, a lot of their gig is just float there. And yeah, either act as a deterrent or make sure nothing's there. Yeah, just just float there and casually this this <laughs> this zip code with its own air force. Its whole job is just float there and remind them what happens if they f around, mm -hmm. and then float over there, project power a little bit more. That's it. Just patrolling the seas and projecting power. I mean, honestly, that's not too abnormal. If you go along the entire west coast of the United States, there are several several military bases along the entire coast that were made specific well some of them were made in like the uh the the 20s and the the tens the 1920s and tens not these ones um that were just ready for anything world war ii some of them were constructed constructed for world war ii after like you know, the Japanese started doing things, but they were never used. Most of those bases never fired any other shots than training ones. Yeah. I mean, a lot, a lot of, a lot of the time when you are that outmatched by something and it's the same thing, it's the same ratio, just scaled up tremendously because I'll be honest, your average group is not winning against a carrier. No. You need a country to win against the carrier. Yeah. And even then, you need specific countries because not every country stands a chance, mm -hmm. right? When you're confronted with such an overwhelming gap in power, a lot of the times it's just not worth it. I'm just not going to bother. Okay, I get it. Jeez. Like, I, I'm living my life. I thought I was somebody, and then I just see that on the horizon. Fine. Sure, I'll pay my taxes. <laughs> like, you're not even my governing body, but if you want my taxes, you can have them. Uh, here you go. Have you some ha taxes. You can have them. <laughs> and it's the same thing for the Imperial Navy. Unless you are one of the major players, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. Even, even like, the major players themselves have to do some of the calculus and go, do we really need this? Because the Imperium is very... They're very, they're, they're zealots. <laughs> once, once that dog bites you, it's not letting go. <laughs> so you really have to consider, is this worth it? <laughs> is this worth 
me fighting this ship for a while and maybe backup arrives. Maybe. Because who knows, even if you win against that ship, the Imperium is petty enough to send another one to finish you off. Mm -hmm. The only reason they don't do that all the time is because, again, spread super duper thin. I mean, <laughs> like, the, the, the counter side to I lived my whole life just reloading guns and firing training rounds is flashbang Alakazam, there's now a line in the middle of the galaxy and I can hear Satan laughing <laughs> everywhere vaguely. <laughs> And this is just my life now, I suppose. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> it's, it's a toss-up. It's a 50-50. You either get to do nothing or you get to do everything. And that's just, them's the breaks. Welcome to life in the Imperium. But even if you are attacked and you're the guy in charge of the diesel generator, way, 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 way down there, I'm talking so far down, you kind of forget what the sun looks like. <laughs> you probably... You know, you in the grand scheme of things, you're not going to be the first one to die. It's still a very important gig. None of this works without you. But, like, you know, you, you're, you're not going to be the first. deep enough in the ship that nothing's really going to touch you. And you may not know. Like, you won't know how the engagement is going because nobody's giving a play-by-play -play down there. You just kind of have to focus in, do your task, and then, oh, we won. Or, oh, we didn't. <laughs> Whoops. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, ju I can just imagine I can just imagine you're in the generator room of an imperial ship and they've got like a football TV screen going with just play by plays of the entire battle outside and you've got people sitting outside just like yeah whenever a shot lands Woo! and then they hear a loud like and they're like wait a minute this is us isn't it <laughs> oh oh no <laughs> remember the generator room specifically because we will get to that in a moment <laughs> <laughs> but as far as imperial jobs go it's not the worst thing ever to be drafted into the navy you know it's 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 listen you could either live in suffering and squalor mid hive city or hey that boat's here i'm just gonna hop aboard now bye and it's one of one one of the reasons that they do not have much of an issue recruiting it's, that's number one we'll, we'll circle back to number two which is something <laughs> <laughs> on most worlds there's no real baggage to joining the navy and part of that is the imperium is steeped in propaganda almost constantly and no one is immune to it it's this unending barrage of nothing is wrong and even if something is wrong our glorious god emperor his sons and our all conquering armies shall deal with it so do your part and the imperium shall be whole again we are eternal we are all knowing and the navy is the glue that holds it all together so it's, it's kind of an honor it's 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 the Marines from um, uh, uh, Starship Troopers, but yeah. sprinkle some religion in there too. Yeah, it's it that's the level of hype that the Navy gets. Now you take that in and you add in the fact that probably, and I'm, I'm being really heavy on that probably here, you are going to be better looking than your average Imperial peasant just just by virtue of just like in real life when you join the military, you have now become a cog in a big machine that does stuff. Lots of stuff, actually. <laughs> We're not going to get into all the stuff. However, a big pro to that machine is it has some vested interest in your health, at least. I mean, you if, you, if you think about it, like, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Yeah. And you can't be the weakest link here. Bare minimum, you cannot be the weakest link aboard. And if you take that fact with the fact that the best way, and I'm going to drop a gem on you guys right now, so... so Take notes. I'm being deadly serious here. If you take away anything from this episode, it's this. The best way to get just stupendously fit is to make it the easiest thing. Make it the make being fit the lazy option somehow and you're set. You're golden. There's no way you won't have abs if you don't want them. I mean, <laughs> look at Hollywood stars and just think about like put yourself in the rock's shoes. You wake up to get to your kitchen, you have to walk through a gym. Wow, I'm definitely going to get a lift in now. Okay, I get to my kitchen. There's a chef waiting with high-protein meals. And my paycheck directly correlates to my pecs? Yeah, I'm going to be massive. This is the easiest gig possible. I'm uh, just going to do it. It's still hard work. Mm -hmm. But because it's the lazy option, it would take The Rock more effort to become fat than it would for him to 
stay just ridiculously jacked. I mean, think about it. Think about it. If his if his kitchen is across his house, or like if there's a gym between him and his kitchen, of course I'm gonna walk through the gym and go. I could do a dumbbell curl right now. That'd mm -hmm. be fine. I might as well just finish my work, my first workout of the day because mm -hmm. I know. Look at size of him. He definitely does more than one. It's it's. I'm not minimizing how difficult the task is because the task will be difficult. But just think about the mental gymnastics it would take for you to wake up, walk through your gym, ignore the high protein meal prepared for you, and the fact that your bag literally depends on your deadlift. You have to you have to actively focus on doing something else in order to keep that from happening. It's it's the same thing. Not all of us have access to that. Obviously. However, if you can MacGyver your life. If you can jujitsu your way into like making something you want to do easier for you. Because humans are inherently like a big part of survival. The really non-glorious part of survival is saving your energy for when you really need it. The human body is really good at that, actually. It's why we're so lazy. <laughs> it's why we're so damn lazy sometimes. Uh, me included, dude. I hate leaving my bed. So if you can make the lazy option... Getting a six pack, you're gonna have one. every single time. You're gonna have a, you're gonna every have single a time. time. If you don't have any pop in your house, if you don't have. If it's just clear water and high protein stuff, and your gym is super duper convenient, you will get jacked. It's almost guaranteed, and it's that same thing that goes on in the Imperial Navy. Again, the Navy doesn't want you as a bodybuilder. <laughs> they just want you to be a strong soldier. However, it's kind of hard to find ten McRibs on board one of these ships. And the only option is a high-protein gruel that the state has mandated I eat. <laughs> and then my job requires me to walk miles as a commute to get places. And then I have to load heavy, heavy, heavy ammunition into cannons several times a day. And if you've seen, there's going to be a picture up of uh, people loading it. It's like 30 people tugging a single round. It's going to make you pretty huge. Yeah. It's going to make you fairly huge. And that is your gem for today. That, that is the biggest takeaway you can get from me. If you want to get fit, listen to me. I got you. <laughs> I'm giving the game away, whether you want it or not. Just make it easy for yourself. Yes. And now that brings us to, why do I mention all of this? Because one of the key reasons it is super duper easy to get recruits for the Navy is because once you become a seaman, there are no longer any shortages for places to put your seaman. Boom! <laughs> I, I'm only... Kind of kidding on that, by the way. It's, again, just think about it. That's like an Imperial hero showing up in town. If he ever makes port, it's getting wild. Mm -hmm. What? It's true. <laughs> yeah, I know it's true because it happens in real life. Too. Oh, yeah. It's just scale it up to the massive scale. Scale it up to like... How many people are there? Exactly. And again, it's either I do this, I get vaguely jacked, I get vaguely healthy, and I will probably live a decently long life, so long as I don't die instantly because my compartment was breached. It's it's a pretty it's much better than being hive casualty number six two one. You know? It's actually no, six two one is way too low. Too hive low. casualty number three million four hundred and fifty six thousand today. <laughs> today. 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 Right. <laughs> and that is the number one way they maintain their massive, massive crews of millions of people. But of those millions, there's a lot of jobs. And loading ammo sucks. However, somebody also has to manage all that waste. That also sucks. Mm -hmm. But that's still not the worst gig imaginable because if you're not managing that waste, you are the guy who has to manage the generator downstairs that will make your skin slough off. <laughs> That's not a joke. Yeah. You you will just die. It's I, a lethal I imagine, job. I imagine the fuels that they use for those ships is... It's, they're it's, bad. It's, it's pretty metal they're stuff. They're bad. Uh, and so for tasks like that, they whip out good old number two. Because, you know, it's super easy to recruit people. And, you know, go be a hero in the Navy. You know, fire cannons. Win against traitors, you know. <laughs> that part's super easy. Getting people for the go reload the fuel cell downstairs... You will be skinless by the end of this. <laughs> that is a much harder sell. And so when that task is present, when as captain you have to staff that department, you will whip out the second tool in your toolbox. Which is just chattel slavery. Oh. <clears throat> That's it. Oh. Yeah. Um, they will. Well. Yeah. 
There are <laughs> thousands of people aboard that ship. Who don't want to be. Who do not get a choice. <laughs> A ship just arrived one day and said, we need bodies. Uh, they said, uh, okay. It, yeah. And then they said, you're the bodies. And it's like, oh, well, great. Listen, GW in all their stuff describes it as the most brutal regime imaginable. It's for good reason. Yeah. For every gun and glory story, there is like <laughs> 10 people who died <laughs> truly sad deaths. 10? Uh, yeah, true. It's like a thousand people. <laughs> Ten. Yeah. Thousand, maybe. Who died truly sad deaths and never had a choice in it. It's a really mind-bending level of suffering, and the Imperium survives in spite of it, not because of it. Because anyone who has a half-decent head on their shoulders in the Imperium looks at it and goes, Oh, oh what are we doing? There's so much wastage everywhere. But also, you can't untangle this behemoth. So you just have to... It's not choked itself out yet, so we just have to ride this out, and I'll fix it slowly, I suppose. Yeah, do what little I can. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day, though, the Space Marines are the poster boys. They pay the bills. So do the guard. They're the close second. I mean, you can tell in all the pictures and all the art who gets models. And while we don't have the exact figures for how hard those two outsell everything else, judging by the fact that a guard army is not a small part of a college tuition to get assembled. <laughs> you can safely bet, you can safely bet that there's a good reason why GW loves them so much. But also, truly, they are popular with the fans. I mean, there's something touching about that war story on the ground, very personal. You're not just a number, it's Carl, and you get to see Carl's whole life and inevitable death. Right. It's it's a little it's a little ounce of he just like me for real for real. And I would imagine it's only strengthened by the fact that like, listen, everything is either aliens or people that have been morphed so much that they're no longer people anymore. They're weapons. Mm -hmm. And here I have just guys. Carl. Carl. Doing his best. Greg. Phil. Mm hmm. They all Matt. have names. It's something that's really easy to lose track of when you see the Imperium's staggering numbers. All of those are names. Even the people fed into the just reactor that is the Emperor nowadays, they all had names, they all had families, they all had loved ones. That's it. And so that it really is a nice grounding factor. And it's no small part as to why the Guard is really popular. It's why I'm fond of them. The Space Marines are popular because, man, what a power fantasy. <laughs> a guy going above and beyond to do the impossible out of sheer duty and diligence? Whew! That is a masculine urge right there, dude. That is the masculine urge right there. It's There's nothing that can get someone hyped up as much as seeing just Space Marines getting the job done. It's like having it's like having uh, uh, a couple dozen Sam Sulek's around, running around in huge Sam Sulek sized armor. Yeah, yeah. However, for every story you get of a guardsman just doing his very best, or a Space Marine pushing to go even further beyond, you will always have the Navy in the background. They are the ones who get those people places. There's no way for the Guard to get to the front without the Navy, and many, many, many a Space Marine has died in the cold darkness of space because in void combat, yeah, you're super augmented, but ships behave weird, and I know how weird they are even though I'm a regular human, so I can just outskill you. It's rare, but it can happen. The Navy is easily, simultaneously one of the most underestimated portions of the Imperium, while also being one of the most spread thin, struggling, and important factions within the Imperium. They are constantly duct taping everything together with nothing but faith, dude. It's so rough. And they don't get any augments for this. Just ships that are enormous, that have history, and that are vast enough to constitute cities and nations with leadership at the front of it all. It's one of the few places where you have actual career progression. You can go and be, you can go from a gunman to being the guy in charge to being the captain of the ship. I mean, think about what your career choices are on a hive world. Yeah, it's death or death. It's death or death. Yeah, and even though you will still have to deal with nepotism and the usual affairs, it's still possible. And now you take that and you pair that with the fact that, again, being on board with nothing there to do except for work, wine, or wank, you're gonna get jacked, right? It's pretty sweet. 
And then they also capture this, everything in 40K has a specific essence they're trying to capture. And the Navy specifically is trying to evoke the essence of the Navy. But the thing I love about them is it's not just the modern Navy. They evoke the essence of navies from bygone eras. If you like the golden age of piracy, these guys give that vibe sometimes. <laughs> if you like back when the British Navy was just this ever-present force everywhere, like the sun literally did not set, these guys do that pretty well. Or if you like the modern U.S. Navy approach of power projection, <laughs> we're the only people who know how to build this, baby. We put... We should put ships places just to make sure nobody else can put a ship there. Try me. <laughs> try me. That's what most of the Navy is. It's just a big, massive try me spelled yeah. out in carriers. If you like that, boy, the Navy has that in spades. And lastly, if you just like sundering firepower, just weapons so massive you need thrusters to compensate and fire them in a specific sequence, <laughs> the Navy delivers that because you will not find weaponry on that scale anywhere else and it's super easy to see why they're beloved tell me where you're going to find a 333 meter bore cannon nowhere nowhere well maybe per Chirabo's closet that's it <laughs> this is it maybe in his backyard it's a huge part my french that's a huge <laughs> closet i promise you right now he's the type to build a howitzer to launch frisbees for his dog <laughs> Just fetch! Boom! <laughs> <laughs> and then Percherabba just... Mm, should take him about five days. I it gives me time to work. I love Percherabba, dude. He's so much fun. I love Percherabba, dude. <laughs> but that closes out this week's episode. Again, next week will be around the anniversary of the channel. When we started out, I had no idea how far this would go. And honestly, I st with the way we're just constantly growing, I still don't know how far we're gonna go. It's just like, oh my God, this is happening. All I know is none of that is possible without you guys. And I'm infinitely grateful for each and every one of you because you are who make this possible. So be sure to leave any questions you have for us down in the comments below. And as always, thank you for being you.